Good evening to you all. Welcome to tonight's Immunisation Coalition webinar event. Our topic this evening is pneumococcal disease in Australia. My name's Susie Blackburn. I'll be your moderator tonight. I am the event manager at the Immunisation Coalition. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we work today and the original Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this webinar. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of Australia. Presenting tonight's session is Angela Newbound, who will be speaking for around 40 minutes. This should give us plenty of time for Q&A um, after the presentation. Angela Newbound is an immunisation education consultant based in South Australia and is a member of the Immunisation Coalition. She's been involved in immunisation program delivery for over 20 years as a provider, program coordinator, and with roles in the divisions of general practice, South Australia Health and the Medicare Local Network. Presently, she's with the Primary Health Network in South Australia. Thank you very much for joining us, Angela, and I will let you start your presentation. Thank you very much, Susie, for that kind introduction. And um, thank you to all of you who have logged on tonight. So. Uh, I hope that uh, this webinar is interesting for you. I hope that we can share some good information. Remember, pop some questions in and I'll certainly do my best to answer them. Um, if you've got any real tricky ones, you know, we can perhaps take them on notice. But I'm coming to you tonight from Adelaide, which is the um, land of the Ghana people. And I certainly pay my respects uh, to the traditional custodians of the land in which I am on tonight. We're going to get straight into business and just test your brain a little bit, but I think this is going to be a pretty easy question for most of you to answer. And we're going to just launch our first poll and find out from you um, what causes pneumococcal disease? Is it Streptococcus pneumoniae? Is it Staphylococcus pneumoniae? Staphylococcus aureus? Or that last choice right there, Streptococcus algolacti. Uh, look, it is a Streptococcus pneumoniae, um, and it was certainly uh, first isolated um, by Pasteur in 1881. So it's a very, very old disease. Um, it's, it's a gram positive. Um, bacteria that just normally lives quite harmlessly in the, the back of the nose and the throat of, of all healthy people, um, but especially young children, um, probably up to about half of them, um, particularly during the winter, will actually harbour this bacteria, um, and generally it doesn't cause a problem. However, you know, obviously in vulnerable people, for whatever reason, the pneumococcus bacteria can invade the body. Um, or the bloodstream, of course, and um, causing pneumococcal disease. So we know that um, this encapsulated organism um, are, are really quite pathogenic for, for humans. We know that this polysaccharide capsule helps it really to resist that phagocytosis. Um, and so this is really the important um, virulence factor for pneumococci. There's probably around about 95 to 100 um, different capsula or antigenic types or serotypes that we often talk about. And each serotype um, elicits um, type specific immunity. So it's kind of going to be a little bit difficult really to uh, worry about getting a vaccine that's going to cover all of those stereotypes because not all of them are going to cause really serious disease in people. Um, but the predominant serotypes do vary. Um, they have uh, different propensities for causing asymptomatic infection or otitis media or meningitis um, or pneumonia. Um, the duration of carriage for this particular bacteria 
um, is generally longer in children than it is in adults. Um, the period of communicability for pneumococcal disease is actually quite unknown, but they are presuming that transmission can occur as long as the organism appears in respiratory secretions. So the lab will probably be able to tell you all of that. So we know that pneumococcal disease can actually cause a wide range of different illnesses. Um, some of these um, obviously quite easily treated with some antibiotics. Some of them that can become a little bit more invasive and we'll certainly be um, talking about some of those. So uh, generally, uh, if this disease does actually invade the body, um, it's certainly an uncomfortable infection for people to have. So we know that pneumococcal disease can be either invasive or non-invasive disease. And if it's invasive disease, you will quite often um, see the abbreviation of IPD, so invasive pneumococcal disease. So your non-invasive conditions, they'll occur outside of those major organs and outside of the bloodstream. So things like um, otitis media, for example, and that's sort of really quite common, um, probably detected in around about, you know, 25 to, to even 55 percent of middle ear aspirates from children that present with otitis media. So it's really um, considered to be the most commonest um, bacterial cause. So we also know that invasive pneumococcal disease, um, you know, certainly has significant morbidity um, in young children. Um, and, you know, this, you know, otitis media, these significant um, uh, otitis media episodes can certainly lead to, to permanent hearing loss in these children. Um, Pneumococcal disease uh, definitely can cause significant morbidity and mortality, predominantly in elderly people or those with immune compromising conditions. Um, so it's, it's really quite um, a big burden for certain groups that we need to certainly watch out for. But we'll, we'll talk about invasive pneumococcal disease, um, which is more serious, and, and we'll talk about that um, quite shortly. So we know that um, we can treat pneumococcal disease with antibiotics. Um, however, the growing antibiotic biotic resistance means really that some patients may be prescribed a combination of antibiotics, but you know we, we're in the health field and we would definitely always say that prevention is far better than the cure. So definitely we need a lot of education um, of our patients in our clinics about the pneumococcal vaccine recommendations and about pneumococcal disease. You know, what is it? Who's the most at risk? So setting those reminders in your practice management software systems um, for recalling people who are at risk of pneumococcal disease or certainly eligible for the funded vaccine program. Um, certainly search your databases to find those at-risk individuals. Um, most people, most adults don't know what vaccines that they should be having. So if the healthcare professional doesn't remind them or educate them, then we know that we've got quite an under vaccinated population, which we can't afford to have. So looking at invasive pneumococcal disease, um, it's really defined as an isolation of um, strep pneumonia by culture and or detection of the nucleic acid um, from normally sterile sites. So they are usually, you know, the bloodstream or pleural fluid. Earlier I mentioned um, really pneumococcal disease is probably um, underrepresented really because there's so many illnesses that might have similar type symptoms as what we talked about before. So it's really important that, you know, we have this continued surveillance um, to, to monitor 
you know, vaccine efficacies. We need to monitor people's uptake of vaccine in the first place. And, you know, certainly we need to be testing for pneumococcal disease, um, sending people for chest x-rays, um, taking blood tests, etc. But, you know, certainly in children that you know, primary bacteremia is the most commonest manifestation of invasive pneumococcal disease, um, probably about 70% in fact, um, followed by pneumonia with bacteremia and meningitis. However, most adults with invasive pneumococcal disease generally will present with um, pneumonia with bacteremia. But certainly a serious disease um, and certainly can be life threatening. So, if we're looking at highest incidence, um, we can definitely see that it's in young children um, as well as the elderly. And we've got a few little stats here over the past few years um, just reporting on some of the cases that we have um, had notified to the National Notifiable Disease Surveillance System. So we know that um, pneumococcal disease has actually been a notifiable disease in Australia since the year 2001. Um, number of notifications fell dramatically after vaccines were introduced for infants. However, the Invasive pneumococcal disease rates remain higher among the youngest and the oldest, and um, that there's absolutely no doubt about that. The notification rate has remained reasonably consistent, and we'll look at some graphs um, along the way. Um, but definitely much higher rates were notified, um, certainly among the Indigenous Australians, much, much higher than the non-Indigenous Australians. So really important for providers to continue to ask the question of every patient, do you identify yourself or your child as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander? So always follow up the asking of that question with the reason why you're asking the question. Um, <clears throat> what we do understand, um, a lot of Aboriginal people that are asked that question um, may become a little bit suspicious to why are we asking that question? Does it mean if they say yes, that they're going to get treated differently? Are they going to get treated um, not well? Um, so we just need to expand and say, do you identify yourself or your child as Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander? Because if you do, um, we have some additional vaccines uh, that we can give you to help protect you from this particular disease. So we can see here um, the numbers. So in 2019, for example, there were around about um, 2,130 cases of IPD reported and 318 of those cases were in children under five years of age. Um, and 959 cases in people above 60 years of age. So definitely um, disease is reported in those two extremes of the age group spectrum. So if we have a little look at um, what the numbers are looking like last year, they certainly did um, vary across the states. So these are actual numbers from the National Notifiable Disease Surveillance System of how many cases were reported. So if we're looking at these numbers in comparison to what we've seen so far in 2022, I can let you know that the ACT is currently this year sitting on seven notifications. New South Wales, you're sitting on 143, so around, um, you know, a little bit under half. Um, Northern Territory, you're sitting on 24 notifications so far. Queensland are sitting on 94, so you're actually doing really quite well up there um, in regards to pneumococcal disease, but by heavens above, you've been hit with some other disasters. Um, South Australians, uh, we're looking at around about 52 cases so far, so around about a third. Tassie down there, um, way too cold, obviously, for pneumococcal bugs to survive because you've only had three notifications so far this year. 
Victoria, you're looking around about um, just a little under half, so 130 cases, and Western Australia, 64 cases. But of course, we do have the rest of winter to worry about. So it will be interesting to see whether case numbers um, do rise um, as we get through this very, very cold winter. So in regards to numbers of notifications, um, I'm just going to have a quick mention about this graph and the graphs in the next few slides. Um, they are a little outdated, but the National Notifiable Disease Surveillance System is currently undergoing an upgrade um, and therefore a lot of data um, is very, very difficult to actually source at the moment. So. I'll talk to the slides, um, but you know we'll still get a, a reasonable picture of what's happening. So we can see, you know, where we were at 2020 with our notifications. So just a little over, you know, around about 1,100. Um, just for um, 2021, there were 1,334 notifications. So just a really small increase. Um, from 2020. So we'll see what 2022 does. Um, obviously, um, you know, perhaps there was a decrease in notifications because our borders were shut um, due to COVID. Um, we do know that, you know, the onset of COVID has certainly changed um, our disease profiles, you know, not only here in Australia, but also um, in countries overseas. So it, it'll be interesting now that we've got our borders open, et cetera, to, you know, what we might see coming. So once again, um, an older slide, but, it, you know, this is just really demonstrating the distribution of serotypes over the years. So, you know, if we were to look at that 2019 graph, there, you know, 64% or 155 of the cases that were reported um, were actually due to a serotype that was included in Numavax 23. So this, this is a graph that's looking at individuals that are 65 years of age and older. And at that time, that was our um, cohort that were due to receive their first funded pneumococcal vaccine. So, you know, are people getting vaccinated appropriately? I think we, we would have to admit that probably they're not. Um, look, we can see the distribution is pretty similar across the previous quarters. Um, during that particular quarter, there were 48 deaths and 33 of those deaths um, were um, pneumococcal serotypes that were covered in the currently available pneumococcal vaccines. So we would like to certainly see an improvement in vaccine uptake. And of course, you know, we've had some changes to the program over time um, where we saw the infant program starting with the seven valent um, pneumococcal conjugate vaccine and that was our Prevnar 7, if you remember back then. And we can really see from this particular graph that herd immunity impacts from that conjugate vaccine use in infants is really evident. Um, and there were decreases in vaccine type invasive pneumococcal disease in the elderly as well. So that um, herd immunity, you know, we really can see. And this has been observed in almost every setting. Um, there's certainly lower rate of growth for um, the 23 valent when compared to, you know, the non-vaccine serotypes. And this is sort of suggesting that there's a direct impact um, from, you know, 23 valent use in this particular older age group. Most um, of the developed countries um, are using 23-valent and also at least 13-valent. Some countries are using a 15-valent. Some countries are even using a 20-valent. But at the moment, most countries are using 13 and 23s in their program. Um, but of course, you know, back 
back in you know, 2020, there was a change to the pneumococcal um, vaccine program, the recommendations, particularly for older um, individuals changed from, you know, perhaps a healthy individual um, not getting the 23 valent, but just only getting a single dose of 13 valent. And that's been a really interesting recommendation, um, given what we actually see. And certainly the USA has maintained the universal recommendation for 23 valent in adults that are 65 years and older. But they've actually moved um, to a shared clinical decision-making approach um, in regard to the use of 13 valent in older people. So it's deemed that most disease in this older age group was due to serotype three, um, against which the vaccines are relatively ineffective. So the introduction of 13 valent to the older person's schedule really had little impact in the United States and was therefore deemed not cost effective. So we really do need to watch this space really closely. However, part of the decision making here in Australia um, was that the 13 valent um, conjugate vaccine does have you know, a slightly better performance around um, community acquired pneumococcal pneumonia. So um, just another um, older graph, but you know, we can just sort of really see, this is the notifications of invasive pneumococcal disease by serotype across all of the age groups, not just the 65 and overs. Um, and we can see here over this period of um, 2019, the number of cases due to the 11 serotypes that are additionally covered by the 23 valent um, vaccine and those serotypes not covered by any vaccine has been increasing steadily across all age groups. Um, and that seems to be blunting the impact of overall invasive pneumococcal disease rates. So it certainly is um, a space to watch and uh, uh, something that I'm sure the experts here in Australia are, are uh, certainly doing. So we talked about um, that introduction of the seven valent pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, um, and then we've moved to a 13 valent, and uh, we will need to definitely be watching that uh, serotype replacement um, very, very closely. So like I said before, you know, shutting our borders um, and with lower rates of any respiratory infection really, except RSV tended to still uh, raise its ugly head, um, but certainly reduced numbers of influenza, we, you know, perhaps could say has had a positive impact in the lower reported invasive pneumococcal disease case numbers. We certainly are aware that influenza activity was, um, has been associated with in, you know, significant increases in the incidence of invasive pneumococcal uh, pneumonia in both children and adults. Um, there's ample evidence to support you know, the historical view that influenza virus alters the lungs in a way that predisposes to adherence and invasion and an induction of disease by pneumococcus. Um, so we, you know, there, you know, you certainly do see people developing pneumococcal pneumonia from having um, a, a, an influenza infection. And so this really does highlight that importance of really advocating for vaccination um, and particularly flu vaccines as well, of course, and really implementing those strategies to increase vaccination rates, um, you know, certainly in your own local areas, your own practices, your own organisations. Um, because, you know, certainly with our borders open now, and we have obviously got um, quite a significant um, influenza, um, you know, activity across the country. Um, so it, it's probably going to result in an increased number of, you know, pneumococcal um, pneumonias. 
So who really is at risk of invasive pneumococcal disease? And the list is actually quite extensive. However, even though these are the people that are at risk of invasive pneumococcal disease, not all of these conditions mean that the patient is eligible for funded vaccine. And so let's look at some of them in a little bit more detail. So let's start with people with underlying chronic medical conditions across the board. So we know that um, due to these chronic medical conditions, um, affected individuals are at increased risk of invasive pneumococcal disease and also at risk of community acquired pneumonia or CAP, CAP, all year round. Um, not only during the winter, um, unlike seasonal influenza. Individuals with um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and asthma or people who smoke um, and those with chronic heart disease and diabetes have really shown to have significant increased risk of pneumococcal disease compared to those without those particular risk factors. Um, these conditions, as well as smoking cigarettes, can definitely adversely affect patient outcomes, including, you know, those short term and long term mortality rates following pneumonia. So with your community acquired pneumonia, and in particular pneumococcal pneumonia, um, definitely has been associated with significant economic burden. Um, but especially for um, the patients themselves. You know, that we've had high hospitalisation rates and certainly this particular disease will definitely impact on the patient's quality of life going forward. So the presence of these chronic diseases not only increases their risk of um, acquiring pneumococcal disease, but can also really adversely affect the severity and the outcome um, of that disease. Uh, we know that both um, COPD and diabetic patients have shown to have um, increased um, hospitalisation rates for community-acquired um, pneumonia. So furthermore, I suppose the risk of respiratory and cardiac complications, um, both of which are associated with increased mortality, is greater in individuals with chronic lung and or heart diseases than in other individuals as well. Diabetes, um, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting disease. It's a severe disease. And, you know, we, we quite often ask our patients, you know, prior to vaccination, you know, as part of their pre-vaccination checklist, you know, do you have any chronic medical conditions? oh, well, you know, they often respond and say, um, oh, look, I've got a little bit of diabetes, but, you know, that's all, I'm a, but I'm a healthy diabetic. Yeah. Well, we'd have to say that there's no such thing as a healthy diabetic. It, it is actually a really um, serious disease and can lead to, to lots of complications. So we know that diabetes has the greatest impact on the risk of invasive pneumococcal disease, as well as community acquired pneumonia um, in individuals under 64 years of age. So this is not just a disease for older people um, risking complications. This is younger people. Um, and, you know, certainly that risk is, um, is, is quite significant in people that are less than 40 years of age, um, you know, or, you know, you know, when we compare these people with someone that is healthy and doesn't have any risk factors at all um, and no comorbidities whatsoever. And it was really interesting that, you know, in a Danish uh, case control study, they were looking at individuals that were less than 40 years of age with diabetes and they were found to have a threefold higher risk of hospitalisation due to, due to pneumonia than individuals without diabetes of a similar age. It's been suggested, of course, that the increased risk of pneumococcal infection in patients with diabetes 
um, probably results from the harmful effects of hyperglycemia on the immune and uh, the immune system as well as pulmonary function. Um, due to ongoing subclinical inflammation, following recovery from pneumonia, deterioration of, the, of underlying cardiovascular disease has been associated also with an increased one year mortality following pneumonia in patients with diabetes versus those without diabetes. So providers should really highlight the importance of pneumococcal vaccination for this group of people, although diabetes unfortunately now does not meet the criteria for funded vaccine. But that shouldn't stop the providers from having this conversation with their diabetic patients. Um, obviously, when patients need to purchase vaccines by prescription, and that would be the alternative for you, for you as a provider, is to send the patient away with a prescription for their 13 valent as well as their 23 valents. Um, if they've got private health insurance, of course, then they can potentially um, put a claim to their private health company and potentially get a bit of a rebate back on the cost of the vaccine. Unfortunately, uh, 13 valent nor 23 valent are listed on the PBS. So the patient would be paying um, for the full price of the vaccine. So the recommendations are in the handbook. I would have to say that the pneumococcal chapter of the handbook is probably the most difficult chapter in the handbook if you've ever tried to read it um, and ever tried to make sense of it. And I think probably as much as they have attempted to um, simplify the pneumococcal vaccine program, um, it's still a program that is exceptionally difficult to navigate um, for providers. So your patients with chronic heart disease, um, including congestive heart failure and cardiovascular and valve disease, they've got around about a 3.3 fold increased risk of community acquired pneumonia and up to almost a 10 fold um, increased risk of invasive pneumococcal disease compared to individuals without um, chronic heart disease. Um, so since increasing age in itself is actually a risk factor for pneumococcal disease, um, but certainly, um, you know, patients that have got increased age are mostly the population that we see that have chronic heart disease as well. So therefore not surprising that these individuals you know, really do need to be vaccinated because their, their risk has increased for those reasons. Um, Hospital-based uh, epidemiological study of invasive pneumococcal disease in adults in Belgium also de demonstrated a significantly higher case fatality rate during hospitalisation in those with heart failure compared with those without heart failure. So Definitely um, take note, look for those patients that you have on your books with chronic heart failure and make sure that they've received um, their pneumococcal vaccines. Once again, um, the guidelines around this are in the immunization handbook. So, but we will also give you another way of identifying your patients at risk and what vaccines that they need later in the presentation. So uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease patients. Um, so these people are, you know, your COPDs, your chronic bronchitis and your asthmas, um, they really are at increased risk also of community acquired pneumonia, as well as invasive pneumococcal disease um, than individuals without those particular comorbidities. Um, they have increased risks of anywhere between 1.3 to 13.5 for, 
for community acquired pneumonia and around about 1.3 to 16.8 risk for IPD. So having um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease often means that they, the patient may be using an inhaled corticosteroid. So this, in addition to increasing age um, and lack of pneumococcal vaccination have certainly been identified as independent factors for recurrent community acquired pneumonia in adults. Um, because patients with chronic respiratory diseases um, have reduced innate defence mechanisms in their airways, um, ongoing subclinical inflammation following recovery from pneumonia has certainly been reported also. A severe asthma. Now, a lot of individuals um, don't understand what that means. Um, some people think that, yes, I, when I run around the oval, I get severe asthma and I need my puffer. That's really not meeting the criteria for severe asthma, um, which technically is that the um, individual um, has required either frequent hospitalizations or certainly frequent medical consults and using multiple medications in order to manage their asthma. Unfortunately, severe asthma doesn't come under the funded program either for pneumococcal vaccination, but it is certainly something that you should be talking to your patients about for sure. So we know that asthma is a really chronic inflammatory disease um, and definitely characterised by that airway hyper-responsiveness, airway inflammation, um, reversible airflow obstruction, and that airway wall remodelling that takes place with this particular disease. So we know that that respiratory epithelium um, is that first line of defence against inhaled um, pathogenic um, agents such as pneumococcal bacteria. Um, and we certainly know that that bronchial epithelium in asthmatic patients is um, definitely abnormal. So this would explain the, their increased risk of invasive pneumococcal disease. So we know that um, you know, people with severe asthma, they've got really impaired clearance of their airway um, and therefore that really does serve um, as a focus for localised infection that can certainly develop into an invasive bacterial infection. Smokers. That is amazing that cigarette smoking is the strongest independent risk factor for invasive pneumococcal disease among immunocompetent, in other words, healthy, non-elderly adults. So if you have patients that are currently smoking, please continue your efforts to get them off the cigarettes. So compared to individuals, individuals who have never smoked, Current smokers and ex-smokers were found to have higher risks of community-acquired pneumonia. Individuals 65 years and over who have never smoked but were exposed to passive smoking were also at significantly increased risk of community-acquired pneumonia. And there was a study done uh, in Australia in 2011 and that demonstrated that smokers were shown to be about 3.7 times more likely to develop pneumococcal bacteremic pneumonia than non-smokers. So definitely, yes, once again, vaccine is not funded for this group, but um, certainly providers should be having that um, conversation with those um, smoking patients that they might have. So pneumococcal vaccines have definitely changed over the years. Um, there's going to be more to come. Like I said before, some countries are already starting to use 15 valent pneumococcal vaccines um, and 20 valent pneumococcal vaccines. So change is certainly one thing that we can absolutely be certain with, is going to happen. So our second poll um, today is 
just asking you what is the difference between Prevnar 13 and Numavax 23? So we're asking, is Prevnar 13 um, a 13 strain polysaccharide vaccine and Numavax 23 is a 23 strain conjugate vaccine? Or is Prevnar 13 a conjugate vaccine and Prevnar 23 a polysaccharide vaccine? Are they both conjugate vaccines but contain different number of strains? Or are they both polysaccharide vaccines that contain different number of strains? Okay, all right, yep. So the, the actual answer is B, um, that Prevnar 13 is a 13 strain conjugate vaccine and your Pneumovax 23 is a 23 strain polysaccharide vaccine. So for those of you in the audience that perhaps don't have a good um, knowledge because you're fairly new in, in the vaccine field, um, the conjugate vaccine is really made by using the same polysaccharide taken off the outer layer of the bacteria, the same polysaccharide as what the Pneumovax 23 is made from. However, what they have done with that polysaccharide, that little sugary coating, is that they have actually chemically linked it on to a, a carrier protein, okay? So the body recognises the carrier protein much better in younger children, whereas with those polysaccharide vaccines, um, young children's immune system doesn't really recognise them. And so therefore, that makes young children um, highly at risk of pneumococcal disease. And we can't give them um, a vaccine that's going to work that well in their immune systems if it's a polysaccharide one. Because a polysaccharide one doesn't use our T cells to, um, to yep. pick it up. All right. So we, we need to change it. So we do use our T cells and therefore our immune system um, finds it uh, much Thank you. better if it's conjugate. Okay. Now, before we move on, it's a really good yeah. question, actually, from Kerry. Um, would people who use vaping products have an increased risk of IPD like people who use smoke cigarettes? Um, you know, there's a bit of evidence coming out now, isn't there, about vaping? What do we know? Vape, well, what we do know is vaping is not good for you. If people <laughs> think that it's a safer alternative um, to smoking cigarettes, um, they probably need to do a little bit more research. And I think because vaping is relatively new um, to our society, I suppose, there's still a lot of work to, to look at. Vaping contains um, a lot of other chemicals. Now, whether those chemicals are going to damage the airways the same way as cigarette smoking does um, is probably yet to, to really be reported on. But... Um, vaping is actually just not a healthy thing to do at all. Um, it, it's really probably as unhealthy as cigarette smoking, to, to be honest. So, Agreed. Yeah. Thank you. And keep those questions coming in. I'll um, make myself mute and let you continue. Sure. Okay. So this is, um, you know, our 13 valent. And like I was really saying, it's, it's just using that chemical linking or that conjugating um, of the that polysaccharide of, of the cell um, onto a, um, a, a protein that's going to carry it along. And our immune system um, responds to the carrier protein. And we've got a few conjugate vaccines in our program. Um, your, influ uh, your Haemophilus influenzae type B, your Hib vaccine, as well as your meningococcal ACWY vaccines are also conjugate vaccines. So we know that, um, like I said, those um, T helper cells don't really respond to um, that polysaccharide. They, they can't really recognise it as a threat. And so the only way to make sure that those T helper cells recognise this 
as a bit of a threat and, and start to actually create some immunity um, is by conjugating it to that carrier protein. So for 13 valent um, pneumococcal conjugate vaccine that we use, which is our Prevnar 13, um, that polysaccharide from the surface of the bacteria is actually chemically linked to a non-toxic diphtheria protein. So I hope that explained that okay. So this is our program currently. Uh, we've got that national immunization program, funded program, single dose of 13 valent um, for Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander individuals over 50 years of age without any risk factors, um, all non-Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people um, at 70 years of age with no risk factors and all individuals with certain, but not all risk factors will get a funded single dose of 13 valent. Obviously for your patients that have had hemopoietic stem cell transplants, completely different ball game, completely. Um, and they would have three doses of 13 valent, but you know, certainly check your immunization handbook, but you know, obviously transplant teams are on top of all of this and uh, they will manage your patient um, fairly well. But just remember um, some of these patients um, in this, this top section here, um, you know, if they haven't, if they've got risk conditions that aren't eligible for funding, they might just have to purchase the vaccines that they need. So our final poll for tonight, just to keep you thinking and on your toes, can Prevnar 13 be given concurrently with Zostavax and influenza vaccines? So no, you can't give them it should be avoided, or yes, you can give it with Zostavax, but not flu, or you can give it with flu, but not Zostavax, or you, yes, it can be given with flu and Zostavax vaccines. What would you do if a patient needed all three vaccines? Yep, okay, well done, well done. Yes, look, they can be um, concurrent, they can be given on the same day, absolutely they can, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a reactogenic vaccine. Um, so you, in this particular case, you'd probably be giving your Prevnar 13 and your influenza in one limb and your Zostavax in a limb by itself. All right, great. Thank you. Okay, so remember we can't overdose patients with vaccines. Um, so if there is no written record that they have received one of these vaccines or any of these vaccines, we will proceed as though they have not received them. Okay, so do your best to locate patient records. Um, if they've had other GPs or whatever, there's not going to be maybe a lot of information on the AIR for adult vaccines. So you might not get what you need from the AIR. Um, but if you have not been able to find records and the patient has no documentation to produce and can't remember what they've had, start them again. We just need to make sure that they have definitely had these doses of pneumococcal vaccine. So with our 23 valent for the new providers, so this is that sugary coating or that polysaccharide coating on the outer surface and it's not conjugated to anything at all. Um, they will, you know, these vaccines will stimulate a B cell response. Um, however, they are T cell independent and therefore they don't result in that long lasting immunity. Um, and like I said before, these vaccines really are not um, suitable for young children. They don't induce an adequate antibody response and Certainly the recommendation now is the youngest age recommended here in Australia for their first dose of 23 valent if they require it um, is actually at four years of age. And there's a question here, Angela, from Fran. Um, is um, 13 as a conjugate va vaccine therefore easier for an older or immunocompromised immune system to recognise and respond to by chance? Well, that's certainly um, part of the thought process behind yeah. giving everybody a 13 valent now. 
yes. um, as well as the older individuals. But most definitely for the immune compromised, um, there's definitely um, the 13 valence certainly does increase the uptake um, and the response of um, pneumococcal vaccine coverage. And um, certainly because they would then go on to have 23 valent afterwards. So definitely the 13 valent is, is an effective vaccine in that case. And Michelle says, is there an upper age limit to receiving 13 over the age of 70? Nope, just nope. if the person is alive, <laughs> Don't worry about it otherwise. But if the person is living and they have never had a 13 valent, absolutely offer it and you can offer that free of charge. Great. It's Thanks so much. NIP. Okay. Perfect. All right. So, um, okay. So whenever we've got this opportunity of giving a vaccine either subcutaneously or intramuscularly, IM is preferred. We do see um, less localised reactions with intramuscular vaccines in this particular instance. Um, but always check with the AIR prior to administering any vaccines, just to make sure that if there is documentation on the AIR that you are of a previous um, pneumococcal vaccine, that you have observed those minimum intervals. Um, and that the number of doses that are, are now recommended have not been exceeded. And so they are recommending now that limited lifetime um, number of doses of 23 valent is only down to two for all individuals. So our 23 valent on the program, we get two doses. Um, of 23 valent are listed on the NIP for your Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people over 50 years of age, um, individuals with certain medical conditions um, that meet the criteria. We've got uh, children aged four years of age, um, if they've got conditions associated with that increased risk of invasive pneumococcal disease. And certainly for South Australia, Western Australia, Queensland and Northern Territory, um, we have an Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander children program, and we would be giving them 23 valent vaccine at four years of age and another dose five years later. So just remember these vaccines otherwise aren't on the PBS. If people need them and they're not eligible for funded vaccine, um, they would need to um, pay full price. There we go. So um, your patient is 45 years of age and diagnosed with a hematological malignancy. What is the recommended pneumococcal vaccination schedule for this particular patient? Should they have Prevnar 13 first, followed by two doses of Pneumovax 23, uh, or Prevnar 13 first, followed just by a single dose of Pneumovax 23, give them the 23 valent first, and then a dose of Prevnar, give them Pneumovax 23 first, followed by two doses of Prevnar 13. Well done. So um, A was certainly the answer. Um, that they have a Prevnar 13 first, followed by the two doses of Pneumovax 23. Just remember, observe those minimum intervals. Um, 12 months be between a 13 valent and a 23 valent. However, two months gap is acceptable in that. And make sure there's five years between your two Pneumovax 23s. If your patient has already received a Pneumovax 23, like the question we had earlier, then definitely wait 12 months to give that Prevnar 13. Um, uh, and then if they need that other Pneumovax 23 dose, certainly make sure those intervals have been observed. Okay. So our 13 valent, I think we're all over this in regards to um, when these vaccines are given, can be given as early as six weeks, of course. And there's an additional dose of Prevnar 13 for Indigenous children in those states and certain medical conditions as well. Um, we certainly know that you are absolutely vaccine fatigued, that you are completely COVID fatigued and you are asked to do so much but just have a little think about some strategies that you could perhaps put in place in your organisation 
um, in regards to trying to increase vaccine uptake and particularly in our older population. Um, there's a lot of focus on the childhood program always, but our adults need this vaccine, absolutely. So we know that increasing coverage is a really big challenge, um, but we, we know also that um, uptake is better when the vaccine has been discussed by a healthcare professional. Um, like I said, we need to use our recall and reminder systems, but uh, we've got our immunisation handbook you can always refer to as well. However, in case you didn't already know, we have the numerous smart vaccination tool. And this has been created by um, using those recommendations in the handbook, um, created by um, experts in the field. Um, it's been created to help the providers out there, whether you're a GP or a specialist or whoever, um, if you are giving pneumococcal vaccines, then this is the tool for you. Um, the recommendations will change. Of course, we know that the tool gets updated um, to reflect those changes. Um, the tool is hosted on the Immunisation Coalition website. And if you just type in Pneumosmart, you will get that on your Google search. So the tool doesn't calculate catch-up pneumococcal immunisations for children. Um, please use the appropriate catch-up calculator for that. Um, and just remember, if there's no written records, we will start again. So please go to the tool. You will need to accept that you have read and agreed to the terms and conditions of the Pneumosmart tool. But at the end of you putting in answers to the questions of the tool, you know, the patient's um, date of birth, um, you know, what medical condition do they have? Have they had pneumococcal vaccines before? Yes, no, unsure. If they have had yes, which one was it? Uh, conjugate, polysaccharide, both or unsure. So there's lots of choices. And at the end of your... Um, time with the Numismart tool, it'll take you to a summary and it will tell you exactly what this patient is recommended to have now and in the future and is if the vaccine is funded or not funded for that particular individual. So we would love you to use the tool, go back to your organisations and practices, maybe run 10 patients through the tool just as a bit of a practice run and just make sure that they aren't missing out on any of their recommended pneumococcal vaccines. There's also the ability to provide some feedback on the tool and we would absolutely love, love, love to hear from you. So um, have a little bit of a play with it. Um, there's no, no harm in that. You can even put in a false patient's name. You, you can just make somebody up. Mickey Mouse is fine, all right, and give them a date of birth. So sorry about taking you over time, um, but definitely just remember pneumococcal disease, it's a, it can be a really serious disease. Um, it, it might not be picked up early. There's a lot of um, you know, con, you know, conditions that have very, very similar um, symptoms. We know that it's probably you know, underreported, but we know historically that vaccine uptake particularly for elderly people is less than optimal so please 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 use the resources available to you okay and uh, get people vaccinated so thank you very much thank for your patience, you Angela. And thank you Susie we might just ask these questions and um, if people need to leave, they can leave. But um, there's a couple of really good ones in there. So um, the first one's quite quick. Nafiz has just um, asked about co-administration of Pneumovax, flu vaccine and Zostavax. I think we've mm -hmm. mentioned that, yes, yeah. we can. Yeah, we can do. Yeah, we yeah. can do that. We just put the, probably put the Zostavax in one limb yep. and your flu in your pneumos in the other. Yep. Great. Um, Ruth is asking, we have a few patients with notes on their files about having um, three Pneumovax. Previously, the docs were uh, taking that as 323 valent. Now mm. that should be mm. two 23s and one 13. Is that correct? 
Rick? Uh, look, maybe it depends on when they had it because we did have a lifetime limit of three doses of 23 valent up until 2020. So um, we would, you would have to look back in the notes and when was that those three doses actually noted um, because they could all be 23 valent. But if there's no record of which vaccine it was, give them a 13 valent, doesn't matter. <laughs> Excellent, good advice. Um, now, the other two are funding questions, and, and I guess we'd just be speculating on um, funding, but do you know if there's any likelihood that COPD patients, or as Deb suggests, um, someone with CCF, diabetes and asthma might at <laughs> some stage down the track be uh, oh, funded? Look, look, the government's under a fair bit of pressure. Um, there were a lot of people, um, you know, much, you know, much more... Um, into pneumococcal disease and, and all of this than, than what I am that were that kind of really were very disappointed by the 2020 changes and, and mm. those conditions that were taken off the funded list. So I think there's a fair bit of pressure um, yeah. from, from those, you know, very, very good groups of people that will push for the best outcomes possible for patients. And we know that vaccination is, is certainly um, something that's really important to them. So it is about uh, it is about watch this space. Yeah. Okay. And the final one before we say our goodbyes: um, if children have not been vaccinated from birth, what is the time difference between the thirteen and is it still three doses? Well, it depends on when they start their yeah. schedule. To yeah. be really quite honest, because um, it is it does have a bit of a date of birth rule to it. Uh, we don't generally catch kids up you know yeah. after four years of age um, because the incidence of pneumococcal disease once they've gone through that early childhood period absolutely plummets and it's yeah. not until later in life that that it comes back again as a big risk so we don't catch up routine missed childhood vaccines uh, for pneumococcal vaccines past four years of age generally yeah okay great um on that note thank you so much we had a couple of comments in the uh, q a that that was highly informative as usual oh, Angela, you've done a fantastic job thank you um and for those of you who are still here thanks so much for bearing with us in the last um few minutes i have popped a couple of links in the chat box for our adult immunization forum which is a packed agenda on the 22nd of august with some amazing Amazing um, speakers from all around Australia. Um, we're, we're really happy to bring that to you virtually this year. Um, Angela's slides and the recording of this event will hopefully be available next week. We have some staffing um, absences at the moment, so we'll hope that timeline will stick and you'll be able to re-watch and access the slides then. Um, and as you saw in the chat, there's a survey coming along. We'd love to get your feedback on uh, what other educational content we can create for you. And um, yeah, looking ahead, we'd love to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much, Angela. As usual, absolutely wonderful. You give your My time pleasure. and your expertise um, to the Immunisation Coalition so regularly, and we are very thankful. So great to have you. My pleasure. And thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, I hope you found it uh, informative. All okay. the very best. Stay safe, everybody. Good okay. Night. Stay safe. Good night.